that I've entitled Eventful because it's a Bible survey through the entire Bible and it's chronologically based. That is, it isn't necessarily, it doesn't go verse by verse, it doesn't go chapter by chapter, book by book. It goes by events that took place over the course of history that brings us up even to this day. And last week we began with a message on creation. All these events start with the letter C. Dan, what was that you you said you were talking about? Seeing, seeing the Bible or something like seeing events in the Bible. They all start with the C. But uh, tonight's message is taken from Genesis chapter 3. And if you know anything about Genesis chapter 3, what's the most significant thing about that chapter? The fall of man. That's right. The fall of every man. Genesis 3 is probably one of the most tragic chapter out of all 1,189 chapters in the Bible. It's the most tragic. It explains a lot of things. Like why I'm so bad. Why, why on my best day I'm still bad. Why I can't do anything right. Why am I, why am I driven to go against what God says? Why is it, it, it explains it. It explains why man is sinful. And the fact that man is sinful explains the symptoms. The things that he does and says and thinks. Uh, it all relates to what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 just begins like this. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice, first of all, the, the um, subtlety of Satan. It says he was more subtle than any beast of the field. In Genesis 3, 1, Satan literally speaks through the serpent. Verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, So this serpent could talk. And the amazing thing is that Eve could understand. It says something about Adam and Eve, too. And most women would not receive a snake's arrival very calmly. Um, I used to work third shift at Dell Computers, and so I had to sleep in the daytime. And especially in the summertime, Liddy would be awake and I would be snoozing. And one summer day, I heard this scream. And I mean, chills went up my back. I thought somebody was attacking her. And I, I come flying out of the bedroom. What's wrong? What's wrong? A snake. And it was a black snake, probably about six feet long, about that big around, right on our patio, right outside our patio. He wasn't in the house. He was outside, but she was terrified of a snake. I don't like snakes either. I really don't. I know that they're God's creation, but I just don't like snakes at all. But before the fall of man, all was peaceful. And the serpent was not necessarily ugly like they are now. It was probably beautiful and not frightening. It was something that Eve didn't seem to be afraid of. and She actually communicated with that serpent. And man and woman were so intelligent that they were able to speak to the animals like Dr. Doolittle. They could speak and listen to the animals. And so he said, well, that does not seem logical. Listen, you've never lived before the fall. You haven't. And I believe that one day in the future, in the millennium, all will be peaceful too between animals and humans in the millennium. It's just a picture. Paradise 
of what the millennium is going to be like in the new heaven and the new earth. Won't it be wonderful to be able to traverse the new earth that God speaks into existence that's not been tainted by sin, to be able to traverse the earth and not be afraid of any animal that you see and possibly even be able to speak to that animal. I wonder if you could understand what your dog thinks, how that would be. Or more importantly, could the dog tell others what he heard you say? Well, it's not possible now, but evidently it was at that point. Imagine though, Genesis 3.14, it says, The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. And then he says, Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So the reason that serpents crawl on the ground today it's because, it's because of what the serpent did in the garden. He was cursed. And so evidently, he didn't crawl on his belly in the garden. Some commentators believe he could, he, he could even fly. I don't know that for sure. The Bible doesn't say that. I just know what the Bible says. But evidently, he could communicate. He could be understood and he wasn't crawling on his belly until he did what he did. From that point on, serpents and snakes would always be associated with evil. If you heard the phrase, he's mean as a snake, or he's just a snake in the grass, well, that's the connotation we have of snakes today. I know there's some people that love them and own them and feed them. I understand that. It's all right. But listen to what Luke 3 says. Luke 3, 7. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then in Matthew's gospel, chapter 12, verse 34, again, Jesus says, O generation of vipers. What's a viper? It's a snake. He says, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And then Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 9, when God refers to the devil, he says, "And, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. When the children of Israel were plagued, remember, with fiery serpents, what did they have to do to keep from dying? They had to look at a brazen serpent on a pole. Serpents, ever since that, have been associated with evil. Notice what Satan does. Oh, did you know the American Medical Association? Their symbol is called a caduceus. And what is it? It's a serpent, it sure is, um, on a pole. And it, the same idea goes back to when Israel was attacked by the fiery serpents and they had to look to a serpent on the pole for healing. That's, that's where it came from. Notice Satan begins by doubting God's word. Anybody who puts a question mark behind the word of God instead of an excl- exclamation point is being used of the devil because what the devil does is he causes people to doubt God's word and that's what he did with Eve even there in verse 1 he said unto the woman yea hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden and what she say and the woman said unto the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God hath said ye shall not eat of it Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So he began by doubting what God told them, and that's how he still works today. But, you know, Eve made a big mistake when she tried to debate the devil. We're not supposed to debate him. Uh, Submit yourself, therefore, to God, and it says to resist the devil, and he will flee from you, James 4, 7. All sin begins in the mind then it goes to action and then it turns into a habit 
And when we stop to consider what he tempts us to do, we're debating the devil when we're considering it. She considered it and she answered, but she didn't answer really the whole truth because God never told him not to touch it. He said, don't eat it, but he didn't say not touch it. So Eve, Eve did not quite understand or maybe in her own thinking, she said, well, I'm not going to touch it and being, being safe and all. But Genesis 3, 3, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But God really didn't say that. And even, even she even added to God's word. She said, God said this, but God didn't say that. And we're warned time and time again not to add to or take away from the word of God. And Satan is all about doing that. He's all about doing that. Adding and taking away. You know, one of the most uh, uh, probably famous cults in existence today, they came knocking on my door last week, the Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, some people criticize you if you say anything negative about another religion, right? But these people use a Bible that's called the New World Translation. And if you read the New World Translation, this sounds very familiar to the King James. Very familiar. But they subtly, subtle, they've changed a few words. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was God. And the word, that's what King James says. They've changed it to say in the beginning was the word and the word was a God. A God. They've added that, not the God, but a God, an indefinite pronoun. They've added that. And you know what the amazing thing is? Uh, with, when, I was, when I studied Greek, um, we, we were asked to take the Greek New Testament and translate sentences, paragraphs. And that was part of our homework, right? Sometimes we would use what's called an interlinear, which is an English translation of the Greek. It has the Greek letters and then the English word underneath the letters. Exactly. And someone brought to class a, a Greek interlinear that was written and produced by the Watchtower Society. And so I couldn't wait to look at what John 1.1 1, 1 said. And you know what? Amazingly, John 1.1 1, 1 had it right in the interlinear, but not in the New World Translation. They want to give you a free Bible they want to talk about the Bible and get you talking. And there's some things that they'll say that sound so right. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They'll say that. But what they mean is Jesus is a Son of God, not the Son of God. You see, they don't believe in the deity of Christ. They don't believe that Christ was God. They believe that He was a God, a lower God. And so they won't say that now when they present their thing to you, but they want to get you talking so that you'll let them come and have a Bible study in your house. But what they're propagating is not true. It's lies because they've added to the Word of God. They've added to the meaning of the Word of God. And I'm not talking about KJV only thing here. I'm talking about what it actually means. They've added, they've in induced words that seem to teach that Jesus was a God because the Bible says there are many gods but not the God, the only God and if Jesus isn't the God if he isn't deity then his death on the cross meant nothing he was just a man and we're still lost in our sin and so just know that just because a group sounds religious it doesn't mean that they're really from the Lord if they question God's word Every wrong action is preceded by wrong thinking. What you think is what you are. Amen. Uh, thinking determines your feelings, and feelings ultimately determine your actions. That's how it works. Most of us, we, we react rather than acting. Most of us do. You're human. And you will react based upon how you're feeling. Okay, but what is it that trains your feeling? Your mind, it's what you think. You might not be thinking correctly, right? 
So that's why it's important for believers to be students of the scriptures and to saturate our mind with God's truth, God's way, what he approves of, what he disapproves of, so that when we see error, we'll recognize it for what it is. The best way to know if a crook is sticky, uh, (laughs) if a stick is crooked, is to do what? Put it next to a straight stick. That's the best way. You can know a stick is crooked. A, a crook is sticking. <laughs> Mercy goodness. Anyways, uh, Genesis 3 3 says, But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. That's not what he said. If you go back and you can read it, it says that he told them not to eat it, Amen. not to touch it. He ends by denying God's word. Genesis 3 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. What? Did God not say that they would die? What did Satan say? Oh, you won't die. And he goes on to play with her. And he tries to convince her that God is trying to pull the wool over her eyes. That God does not really want her to know. Really, he doesn't want her to eat the fruit because he knows that if you eat the fruit, you'll become wise. And you'll be your own gods, like gods, which God didn't say that either. But uh, he was misappropriating God's word. John eight forty four says, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar... And the father of it. So what he said in Genesis 3 was the first recorded lie in the Bible. And he he said it to Eve. Genesis 3, 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That is called a sandwich lie. It's a lie in between two truths. The truth is... God knows in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Was that true? Yes, they were opened when they ate the fruit. And it says, knowing good and evil. Did they know good and evil? Yes, that's the truth. But the lie was in the middle. You shall be as gods. So he intermingled lies in truth. And he still does that today. Uh, The most dangerous kind of lies when it's very close to the truth. That's when it's most deceptive. Genesis 3, 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. How many of you thought that the fruit was an apple? Did you see apple anywhere? Doesn't say apple. That's what people think that it might be an apple because it's a beautiful, red, shiny, and it's pleasing to look at, I guess, if you like apples. But but it doesn't say in the Word of God that it was an apple. We just know that it was a fruit. Now I want you to notice a few things I underlined in that passage. First of all, it says the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Underline that. Good for food. Anything wrong with food? No, you have to have food to live, right? It says, and it was pleasant to the eyes. So it wasn't, you know, like green. It was, it was pretty. It was something you, you, would, you would like to eat. And the tree was to be desired to make one wise, because that's what Satan told her. God knows that if you eat this, you'll be wise, okay, and as gods. And so uh, when he showed those three things, well, when she re- reveals those three things, she all also reveals the same thing that Satan uses today to tempt us to sin. The same thing, good for food, appeals to what? The flesh. Pleasant to the eyes appeals to what? The eyes, the lust of the eyes. Desire to be make one, make one wise. What does that appeal to? 
the pride of life. And if you look in 1 John 2, verse 15, it's the same thing that's in the world today. 1 John 2, 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, here they are, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. So God said, don't eat this fruit. And Satan used the same thing that he uses today to tempt us to sin. It appeals to the flesh. It makes you feel good. It appeals to the eyes. It it satisfies that uh, covetousness, that desire to have. And then it appeals to the pride of life. If I can do this, then people will look up to me. They'll think I'm important, I'm special. The same thing, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Why do you think when you see an automobile commercial, it's always shiny red, there's not a flaw on it, and it looks as if the people that are driving it are having the time of their life, and it can go anywhere, it's all terrain. It can go over sand dunes, and while you're, you know, they always paint a picture that if you, you, you can't be happy and successful unless you have this car. Amen. The same thing with beer commercials. Uh, every time you see a beer commercial, they show a beer poured in a frosty mug, especially in the summertime, with a head on it that's spewing over the mug. And it, it's in a room full of people that are just having fun. And they try to get you to believe that if you drink that beer... You'll have fun too, just like everybody else. Reach for the gusto. Life only goes around once. And they paint a picture like this is the greatest thing to have. They never show you what happens to a man that gives his life to alcohol. They never show you that. They they never show you the families that are ripped apart because of an alcoholic. They never show you that. But they only show you what appeals to your eyes and it appeals to the, the, the flesh. And I'll tell you what, beer doesn't taste that good. Amen. Anything that you have to develop a taste for isn't worth it, friend. Amen. It does not taste good. And yet people think they have to have it to be cool or to be popular and you, or to meet guys or to meet girls. You've got to drink. No, you don't. That's the devil's lie. But he uses the same modus operandi today that he used with Eve back in the garden. It appeals to the flesh or to the eyes. You've got to have it. You won't be happy till you have it. Or it appeals to the pride of life. You want to be rich, not because you really want money, but because you want to walk through the door and everybody goes, "Ah, he's here. Like you're really important. Okay? 1 John 2.15 says that's in the world. Now Eve indulged in all three. It was good for the food, flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. And to make one wise, she thought, but it wasn't a wise thing to do, was it? Why was it not? Why why was it not wise? Because she disobeyed God. She went against her creator, And just think about how good she had it. I mean, really, think about that. They really had it made, didn't they? They didn't have to work. They were in that garden. Well, they had to tend the garden. But God placed them in that perfect utopia that never rained, evidently. It it watered itself. And and they watched the trees. God created the trees with the age and had different fruits. And they technically, they had a lot of freedom. They could have eaten from any tree in that garden. Well, who knows what kind of trees they had there. They could have eaten of any tree in the garden. They were just, and they would have lived forever that way had they not done that one thing. So, so it's, all, it's all the woman's fault, right? Wrong. Wrong. That we, we saw the subtlety of Satan. Now notice the sin of Adam. He becomes the first sinner. Genesis 3, 6, what does it say? And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. 
and he did eat. Now, was Adam, was Adam innocent? No, because Adam knew that they weren't supposed to eat from that tree. And it, it appears that he was with her whenever she took that tree, that, that fruit. So why did Adam not say, put that down? God told us not to eat that tree. What he did was he gave away his leadership to Satan. God made him the leader of that couple. He was the spiritual leader of that home. He was supposed to say, honey, no, we can't eat that. But instead, he ate it. And so because he was the leader, guess what? He was responsible. He was a passive man. Passivity has destroyed many, many marriages. Because men do not take their rightful place in the home. It's, it's causing our whole country to come apart now. Because children are being raised with no fathers in the home. And it's impossible for a mom to be a father. She can try. But she will never be a father. Amen. And kids will always long for their father. And it's sad because... Uh, the family unit is disintegrating because of lack of male leadership in the home. If you have a husband that wants to lead you, then you should be thankful for him. Adam's sin. The Bible says in Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one woman sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Does it say that? No. It says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all of sin. Who was the sinner in Eden? Adam, Adam was. 1 Timothy 2.13, it says, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So both were responsible, but Adam was the one that God blamed for that sin. Eve was deceived, but Adam did it liber deliberately with his eyes wide open. Eve did it emotionally, but Adam took it willfully. Adam was the head of the human race, and so we are all condemned as children of Adam, and we inherit his sin nature. The reason that you sin today it's because Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden. That's called original sin, which passed on all, to all men and all women, the sin nature. Notice what they do in Genesis 3-7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Wow, they didn't know that before. But once they ate the forbidden fruit, once they sinned against God, they then knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Have you ever thought about that? They didn't know that they were naked. They were totally innocent. Amen. And when sin came into the world, they became self-conscious, self-aware. You hear so much today about self-awareness. You need to be more self-aware. No, you don't. You need to be more God-aware. Because self is natural. You always look after self. Don't you? If you hit your thumb with a hammer, what do you do? You put that thumb in your mouth. <laughs> you take care of self. But that's just a, a sign that we are the children of Adam. We take care of self. We always put self first. We don't have to read a book and learn how to be self-aware. Most people are very, very self-aware. We need to be more God-aware. He attempts to cover his nakedness before God, like if he really could. Genesis 3.21, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make, make coats of skins, and clothe them. Amen. Why did God have to clothe them? They were already clothed, weren't they? Well, they had the fig leaves that they made. That was 
that was their doing. But God said, no, you need more than that. And so he covered them up with, with animal skins. You know what's significant about that? Sacrifice. Yes, an animal had to die. Amen. And that right there is where you see the first picture of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Amen. An animal had to die, shed his blood. It was always a bloody ordeal. And then he took the skins of the animal and clothed Adam and Eve. And that is a picture of grace. Did they deserve that? What did, what did God say? In the day that you eat there, thereof, ye shall surely die. die. Did they die? No. They died later. They, did, they died later. I don't think they would have ever died if sin hadn't come into the world. But they died later. But what... Instead of killing them in the moment, which he could have done, instead he gives them a coat of fur. An animal gives its life so that they can be covered from their nakedness because of the grace and the mercy of God. Genesis 3, 8 through 10, as we read about how Adam tries to hide from God. Verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. (laughs) Now think about that with me. You're going to hide yourself from the God who spoke those trees into existence, the God who knew exactly where every tree was planted in that garden. Don't you think that that God could know where you are? And yet they hid. That was a human response. And it still is. When we sin, we try to hide our sin. But you can't hide it from God, can you? Amen. You can hide it from people, but you can't hide it from God. Amen. It says, verse 9, The Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? Uh, did God already know where he was? Yeah. Sure. Why did he ask him, Where are you? He asked him, where are you, to solicit a response. He wanted Adam to say, I'm right here. He wanted Adam to do that. That is to come forward and admit that he was hiding. And he goes on to explain himself. He says, he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now God already knew the answer to these things. He never asks a question he doesn't already know the answer to. Why did he ask the questions? He wanted Adam to acknowledge what he did and admit what he did. And when he tried to explain it, it was obvious it was a shallow attempt to cover up what he had done. Verse 12, And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did pass the buck. It was the woman's fault. Exactly. The woman that you gave me. By the way, she was the only woman on the planet. Exactly. But God gave her to him. Instead of being thankful for her, he blamed her for the whole thing. And it was God's fault because he gave him to her, gave her to him. Verse number 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, what, hast thou, what is this that thou hast done? So she has to own up to her sin too. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Again, it's the devil's fault. The devil made me do it. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And you'll see there are other curses that take place there. But when we sin, instead of hiding, instead of running from God, we should run to him. You know why? Because he's loving and merciful and he really wants us to be in fellowship with him that's why ultimately he called for Adam where art thou because he wanted a relationship with Adam and he still wants a relationship with us even when we mess up he still wants a relationship with us there was this lady who was really struggling to pay her rent a lot of people are doing that today 
and uh, she hid from the landlord. She knew the rent was due, but she didn't have the money, and so the landlord came knocking on the door, and she didn't go to the door. She knew he was the landlord. She was really quiet. She turned all the lights out and played like she wasn't at home. And so the church friends, they took up a collection for her to help her pay her rent. And they took it to the landlord and asked him to tell her that it had been paid in full. The landlord went back to her house and knocked and knocked and knocked and she wouldn't answer the door. Later on, he saw her in town and he confronted her about the issue and he told her the good news that her rent had been paid in full. She said, thank you, but I have to confess, I was home this morning, but I wouldn't answer because I thought it was bad news, not good news. And that's exactly how Adam and Eve felt. God said, Adam, where art thou? Adam's thinking, uh-oh, we're caught. I don't want to deal with this. And so he hid. In reality, God wanted to forgive them. He called their name because they were important to him, because he loved them, and he wanted to extend grace to them. He knew that they were human. The psalmist says God knows that even that we're dust. We're just dust. He knows our weaknesses. And so instead of running from him when we sin, we should run to him. When God came looking for Adam, it was really good news. It wasn't bad news because he was going to provide a sacrifice. The Bible says where sin abounds... Grace doth much more abound. And that is so true. Remember that. When you feel like you've sinned away your day of grace, where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. There's some people really need to hear that. Oh God, Thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from Thee. Psalm 69.5 And that leads us to the good part. The redemption of God. Verses 9 to 24. The only attributes we saw of God in the first two chapters were things like His power, His glory, His magnificence. Uh, magnificence. But now that sin has entered the scene, we see another side of God. We see His redemptive powers. There are four ways that God showed Adam grace. The first one is in seeking Him out in the first place. The Bible does not record of man's search for God, but of God's search for man. Jesus said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You say, no, I sought God. But actually what you did is you responded to His call, which was Him looking for you. Nobody ever gets saved unless God has not first come to them and pricked their heart, showed them their need, and offered His sacrifice for them. Uh, you say, well, I don't understand why people don't accept Christ. Well, maybe it is. He hasn't dealt with Him yet. But I know that when God does deal with you, either you explain it away or you deal with it. And some people, it takes a while. Some people, it takes the middle of a crisis before they really realize this is God working in my life. I need to turn my life over to Him. That's why we should really never quit in praying and encouraging people to trust Christ as their Savior. Really, you can't understand salvation apart from the Holy Spirit. You can't. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them for they're spiritually discerned. You can't discern spiritual things like salvation until the Holy Spirit teaches you. So he comes to Adam. The second thing he did is he promised them a Savior. Genesis 3.15 is the first promise in the whole Bible of the coming of Christ. It says, I will put enmity between thee, talking to the Satan, the serpent. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. What is that referring to? Jesus. The heel of the, of the Lord. It was nailed to a cross. It was bruised. 
He said, it shall bruise your head. That's a fatal wound. And that's what happened on the cross too. Satan's doom was sealed at the cross of Calvary. It's a profound verse. The first pronouncement of the gospel is a prediction of Calvary. In Genesis chapter 3, the same chapter that the fall of man is recorded. And ever since then, a great battle has existed between Christ and the forces of evil. But on the cross... Christ will forever win that battle. Another way that God showed Adam and Eve grace is in clothing them, as we mentioned. He provided coats of skin for them to wear. A picture of grace. And then the final way that God showed grace to Adam was in removing them from the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3.24 So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life he said well that seemed like punishment he kicked them out of Eden but in reality it was grace because what if they had eaten of the tree of life they would have still been living in their sin today It was grace when God kicked them out of Eden. It was a good thing. So the promise for the believer is not to live forever here, but in a glorified state, in a new heaven and a new earth. Before sin entered the world, there were seven words Adam never knew. Death, nakedness, curse, sorrow, Thorns, paradise became a wilderness. The once docile tiger that they could talk to became a herbivore. He yet was an herbivore, became a meat eater. Everything changed. What do all those seven things have in common? Christ suffered every one of them on the cross. Everything that Adam experienced because of sin, Christ experienced to erase that sin. So as we embrace this time of the the year around Easter, this week, Wednesday, was like a silent day. Nothing's recorded about what Jesus did on Wednesday. But this Sunday, we'll be preaching a message that I've entitled, A Lot Took Place in Seven Days. And we'll end it with the resurrection of Christ. So be praying for each other. Encourage each other. And be thankful for the salvation that we can have by grace. Be thankful that Jesus took our curse on the cross. The curse that we deserved. There's that one song I used to sing all the time. I should have been crucified. We should have been crucified. But he died for us. And so let's praise him for that. And praise him for the results. The resurrection. Father we thank you for loving us today. For going to the cross of Calvary for us. Lord we thank you for the promises in your word. That we can hold on to tightly. Lord I'm thankful that you didn't just record. The good things that men do. But you also chose to record man's sin man's problems the negatives help us to learn from Adam and Eve not do the same thing help us to run to you Lord and receive forgiveness love and grace use us this week for your glory in Jesus name we pray Amen